I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning into the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and today I have Miles Neville and Preston Lentfer back on the podcast. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to be here with you and especially with Miles. Yes. Always a wonderful guest, uh, both of you. And today's topic, a topic that we're all pretty uh, involved in, if you will. And before we kind of get into the topic of advanced reloading and, you know, kind of our load development process, I want to call out that it is match shooting season. Now, some parts of the country, every season just morphs into the next one but out here where it gets wintry we have a very distinct you're not doing anything in the world of precision rifle and the prs is back and the nrl hunter it's back and you guys have uh got some dialed up systems ready to go and i wanted to point out we've talked a lot about it you know for the listener out there that that listen miles back in the prs shooting open division no more gas gun yeah Bolt gun six arc this year. Bolt gun six you're, arc. You're going to enjoy that. I oh, guarantee he it. He couldn't help but smile the whole time he said that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is your gas gun still intact or did you tear no. it apart? Yeah. Well, it's back intact as a varmint rig. Okay. Stripped all the weight down. It's about 10 pounds now. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get in there uh, towards the end of this podcast and I want to talk about that rifle and about your match gun and your process for load development because, you know, the the comments that we get, the emails we get, podcast at hornady.com for the listener out there, or just the comments here on YouTube. Um, people want to know your load development process or our load development process. And, you know, we've done a lot on this platform, well, mainly because a lot of your testing, where we've dispelled some of the older thoughts of how load development worked. OCW, the ladder test, the Saturday test. Uh, all of the, you know, those traditional load development methods and barrel nodes and harmonics and all of that kind of thing. We've dispelled a lot of that with just straight up high volume, statistically valid shooting. And some people, you know, they, they weren't ready for that yet. And some people are really digging into it. And uh, uh, outdoor writer Tyler Friel with Outdoor Life, he's just now starting to put out some information in big forum, in editorial big forum here about this stuff, measuring stuff in group radius and finding a node and what that looks like. And then what happens if you try to do that same test three or four or five times and shoot 30 shot samples. And, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see that information get out there. And I bring that all of that. And I say all of that to say, there are some advanced reloading techniques that a lot of people still do and, and did years past that we're finding maybe aren't necessary. Maybe they're not as advanced as we thought they were. And ultimately, it depends on what you're doing, and that will dictate your level of, uh, you know, how deep this down the rabbit hole you want to go. Right. So I'd like to, to throw out some of the traditional advanced reloading topics on bullets and brass prep is a big one, load development. Define those and, and relate to what kind of testing you've done with each of these variables, and then dive into your load development process and it's very similar to but slightly different than Preston's load development process. So I'd like to hear uh, how that goes and and the processes that you guys have and even though there's some slight differences, it's really the same process that we all use now, Jaden, Jacob, Joe. I mean, it's just kind of what we do here. Yeah. So variations of the same yep. flavor. With that said, one of the places I'd like to start is with brass prep. Because that was one of the things, you know, me as an up-and-comer, Preston as an up-and-comer in the long-range competition game, oh, better sort your brass. And we had a gentleman that worked here, uh, Lonnie Hummel, was a prolific bench rest shooter. And he was working part-time in tech when I started. So I was trying to buff Lonnie. I mean, shooting tiny little groups at a thousand yards. I'll listen to what he has to say. And he recommended sorting your brass Mm -hmm. uh, by weight. Right now, I I did that, and then I didn't do that, and I haven't done it since. Uh, <laughs> so, have you done any sort of 
uh, weight sorting of the brass? And did you see any efficacy there? Uh, yeah, I've done some. Uh, one of our, a couple of our other engineers have done it as well. I think I, I know Joe has done it. Uh, I know Tyler um, has done it, and our newer guy Dylan uh, has also looked into that. And um, w- what we all came away with as far as weight sorting is is that it doesn't really correlate strongly to to any metric that we can then shoot and see a performance difference. Mm. Uh, th- if you could isolate volume variation, then then you can see a small trend with velocity because that go- plays into that pressure velocity thing, uh, the pressure build and volume build. You know, okay. right? you, so if you start with a different initial volume, then you can get pressure and velocity differences. Most of the time, that's worth like ten foot per second, maybe of okay. of the same of a, a moderate or bad lot of the same lot of of our cases. Anyways, that's pretty typical what we see um a lot of times less um but <clears throat> the weight variation that most people are seeing when they weight sort is from the extractor groove cut because awesome. the, the, the traditional thought process is well i fired these cases i've resized them they're all fired in the same chamber resized in the same size die externally trimmed. yeah trimmed they're all externally the same dimensions so then the only thing that this weight variation can come from is internal dimensions and internal volume. That's the correlation that people try to make. But the, the real problem is that they're mass produced on a, basically an automatic, automated lathe that cuts that extractor groove and it doesn't take very much variation in that to get you a couple grains of, of yeah. weight mm. difference. And so when you then take all those weight sorted ones and then you volume sort them, you find almost the same population. Uh, as ones that, you know, aren't. <laughs> so not a really useful, you, you know, spend yeah, of yeah, your time. Yeah. Weight sorting alone is, is not. And there, there's no great practical end user, average user way to, to sort by volume, right? Yeah. No, you, uh, the traditional way is that you put a dead primer or an upside down primer into the case uh, and then you fill it full of soapy water on a scale and don't spill any. Uh, and then get the water weight out of it. And that is really subject. The, the precision of that measurement varies person to person, basically, depending on how consistent they are at filling the case to the mouth. Sure. So, um, there's some, yeah, there's some other tools out there um, that you can get into, but uh, that are quicker and better, but... Uh, More expensive. Yeah. And not, not probably advertised for yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know that anybody really markets it. It's kind of a, a thing that we have that... Hmm. We haven't marketed yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> Interesting. Or may never. Yeah. Probably won't ever, but yeah, I don't know. So the weight sorting, again, one of those things that, oh, you got to do that. And then as it turns out, really doesn't make a difference. The volume, if you were going to sort, volume is the way to do it. Really not an expedient yeah. way to do that. And Very, even, yeah, labor intensive and the fruits of it are not, okay. not that bad big uh, probably, for most applications probably like, worse than the pareto principle the 80 20 rule probably like 95 5 yeah, you which know? the pareto principle is there's 20 percent of the things do 80 percent of the work and you know if you're trying to dial in a load it's probably easier to just play with 20 percent of the stuff to do 80 percent of the work yeah, yeah. than the opposite and I, I clarify too that like what we're talking about here is now modern same lot, same manufacturer components. Sure. If you're mixing manufacturers, mixing lot numbers, um, and All especially yeah, and if, if you're loading 1962 Lake City 30 out six brass, well, then some of this makes sense. And I think that's where a lot of these traditions kind of originated from. from. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Back in the day, the, the quality of the components wasn't near yeah. what it is today. Well, I'm going to walk through a couple more brass prep things, and then I'd like to culminate just the brass prep with you've done some extensive large volume actual shooting uh, in the lab mm-hmm. with hyper prepped brass and then basically no prep whatsoever. Uh, so g- moving from the weight sorting to something that Preston and I have dabbled in shortly, which was flash hole deburring. You know, dabbled. That's, yeah. I used to be the pastor of it. Now <laughs> I don't do it at all. Holy yeah, cow. Well, yeah, the pastor. The pastor of the Deber. Well, I it, used to do so much of it because you know, in tech, we could answer phone calls and and work on stuff. If not everybody could do it, but we certainly could. You know, just sometimes you get a little unfocused if you're doing multiple things at once. For me, it wasn't a problem, and I would do all of my match 
brass right. and then holy cow was it a pain it was yeah because one's just getting it down in there and hornady uses a punch for our flash holes uh you most, know some of the higher end yeah. brass that's custom made small volume they'll right. drill it but most of it out there is going to be a punched flash hole so go in there with the deburr and give it a couple spins um i never experienced a benefit like preston mentioned it was one of those i'm sitting here i have this tool okay I, i'll just, just do it just yeah. do that so well, and you'll see whether it's rifle building or reloading or whatever in precision shooting there's a lot of well it can't hurt that's true that, that was the mentality do. yeah mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't hurt so it potentially could make it better it may not matter but it can't hurt so there's a lot of the a lot of practices that people have okay with. have you any experience with the flash hole deburring uh just the one test that i did um i would say in general you're not going to see, you may see some benefit, but they're going to be very small. That's another one of those things that's like a lot of work for potentially no right. or very, very small benefit. Well, and I suppose if a flash hole was partially obstructed or right, something right. like if, that. Yeah, when it punched through the through the web, if that punch came through and didn't completely clear that that piece of that cylinder of material and it's hanging on there or partially blocking, you know, that's definitely something that can cause some performance issues right away. Um, and there are different volumes and shapes of cases with different primer combinations that can have different like ignition happy spots. Mm -hmm. Um, and it may be that, you know, what, depending on what end user is using, it could fall right on that threshold where maybe cleaning it up gives this guy more benefit than it does this guy. Um, but like stuff like six arc, six, five creed more, most of the PRS match cartridges that you see. Yeah, even the bench rest and F class yeah, yeah, cartridges. Yeah. Dashers, you know, BRs, BRAs, all that stuff is in a size of case that y you're going to have to really dig in deep to find any meaningful difference. Yeah. So another one where you can do it, it's like we talked about, not going to hurt anything. Maybe on a very, very small scale, it might help, especially if you get one that was slightly obstructed, it'd get that out of there. But again, not a not a big oh invest this time right. and you're gonna you're not you're your not SDs. gonna see oh my my standard deviations are fifteen foot per second oh deeper my flash hole oh now there's six you're not gonna that's not, not gonna, gonna happen not gonna do it yeah and not to to just regurgitate the small sample size podcast but if anybody did get a warm and fuzzy out of it it's likely due to a small sample yeah. size well, you know like, no, we used to do it it's good that you brought that up we we should just regurgitate that a little bit because. You can hide behind smoke and mirrors and not know that you're hiding. You know, you can see, oh, this is the data. It says it right here. Right. My five shot standard deviation is two. I got an SD of two. And you can think and then make you feel warm and fuzzy, but you're not looking at real data. And so the listener, if you haven't, should be encouraged to go back and listen to your groups are too small. Episode and your, 50 and 52. Yep. Your groups are too small and your groups are still too small. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, one of the the last things that I dabbled in was well, certainly not the pastor of dabbled in. Yeah, and I probably, I didn't want to say disciple, you know, yeah. because we did a lot of them. We like, did totes of brass. Just yeah. went after it all day. Yeah, well, it was just sitting there. Yeah, yeah, talking on the phone. Well, one of the things that that I did that uh, I thought was somehow going to help me was when I got into the competitive game in 2013, got my first like precision rifle was through at Winchester. And I got 250 sticks of brand new 308 Winchester brass, new employee. I was all excited. And so I went through, deburred all the flash holes, trimmed everything uniform. I even probably weight sorted some of it. Uh, and I went through and outside neck turned it. Now, when I bring up outside neck turning in the world of advanced reloading, I don't mean, oh, you got a, you ordered a custom reamer with a small neck and you have to turn these necks. I mean, the guy that's taken brass and just taken off the high spots, uniforming the neck diameter, which sounds like it would help with something. Um, but again, I never experienced any benefit. It's just something that I did. Uh, I was probably well inside the noise of me learning really how to shoot and be a precision rifleman uh, and just sending so shots down range. But I did it anyway, and it made me feel better about what I had. And then you go to a couple matches and you start losing brass here and there. And next thing you know, I don't, I don't want to do it again. Never yeah. going to do that again. So <laughs> it's like you, fire form and Ackley cartridges. You can, if you would, talk about that test you did where you took hyper-prepped brass because you 
outside neck turned that as well. Right. Uh, and how that test went, and it really kind of highlights some of these points here. Bore driver ELDX, fast and easy to load. The polymer base seals the bore and engages the rifling while the post and pedals grip the bullet's boat tail. With its superior ballistic coefficients and reduced drag, the bore driver ELDX drives its 340 grain bullet to target with the energy and accuracy that turns shots into success. When you have one shot this muzzle loader season, make it count and use the best. Bore driver ELDX from Hornady. Yeah, I, before I get into that, I'd say like neck turning in general, I, I would only do that if you plan to, in conjunction, have a custom reamer made that basically you're neck turning to control the expanded neck diameter um, really tightly. And, and there may be some, again, this is like some very, very small benefit. You can massage in a little bit of maybe extreme spread, standard deviation, but we're talking like really, really small changes here Okay. for a lot of effort. Again, a lot of effort, really small changes. And so, but what I had done with this test was just a Sammy Reamer, uh, six arc, but it was a HS precision match quality, like top end barrel, high quality cut rifle, yep. everything. Yep. Lapped Every, in. It, what I, what I, it's a rifle. I'm still shooting, um, for matches this year until I get scared and pull that barrel, but yeah. still think, pounds. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm probably about 3000 rounds through that one. So, um, but I took, Cases that I had weight sorted, then volume sorted, and then flash hole deburred, uh, trimmed, chamfered, deburred, honed the inside of the neck, turned the outside of the neck, and it may not have been all necessarily in that order, but yeah. basically I had taken these cases um, and gone through and sorted them as in every way that I knew possible, sorted and treated them in every way I knew possible, uh, and then took weighed bullets and sorted bullets, and then... Uh, dipped them into graphite when I seeded them, weighed the powder charge to two hundredths of a grain or whatever. To and, the kernel. Yeah, yeah, basically to the kernel, what our A&D scale would, would take. And I did 35 of those cartridges, and then I randomly pulled 35 cases out of a bulk box. The Prim same lot number. Same though. lot, yeah. Pulled them out um, and, yeah, primed them up, load them up the same way. Same Inside, outside, neck chamfer. Right, yeah, just did a, no not, even, not even an outside, just an inside neck chamfer with the BLD chamfer mm -hmm. tool, uh, unsorted bullets and the same powder charge and holding the powder charge consistently the same way. So I had all the prep and then I had random odds and 35 of each and they're indistinguishable from each other. For velocity, for dispersion, yeah, for Yeah, velocity everything. spreads, dispersion, mean radius. Uh, within, within the variation that you see on a 35 shot test, which is pretty small by the time you get to 35 shot tests um they're yeah basically indistinguishable data sets wow well that makes me feel like i still would have done the same things in tech preston i still would have done all those yeah but knowing what we know now and, and Jaden has talked about and you've talked about with the small sample size thing like i just keep thinking back to that one rifle that absolutely shot great like six tenths of an inch and then i go to repeat it and it's just it it won't do it and then you feel real bad about it you know <laughs> and i remember i remember getting into precision long range shooting and reloading and doing five shot tests on everything and i don't know how many times that i would neck turn cases because i had done that as well just in small batches tried it out see if it you know and i would wait sort and I would base to ogive sort and, you know, do all, I would, I would take basically all this stuff that I would do all these crazy things. And then I'd take random stuff. And it was just a flip of the coin, whether this was better or worse than just grabbing mm -hmm. off the shelf components. Um, and I don't know how many times I did that. And then you get to thinking like, what am I doing wrong? Like what, what about this process am I doing to try to make this better than I'm doing wrong? When really you're just, you're playing the random odds. Uh, yeah. yeah and I would say I had a bad day of shooting, you know, if I couldn't repeat Right. The, the awesome result I got. Oh, I must, I must right. have been bad that day. Yeah, too much yeah. coffee, something. Yep. Yeah. Well, in, in regard to this brass pep conversation, before we change gears, Preston and I, right around the same time, both had uh, Magnum rifles, 300 wind mag for Preston, 7 mag for me, that we were struggling to really get dialed in with what our expectations thought they should be. And we were doing all of this process, again, shooting small sample sizes. Um, weight sorting brass inside outside neck chamfer 
turning necks, deburring flash holes, weight sorting. I mean, you name it. We were right. going up, down, and sideways with this stuff, trying to get things really dialed in. We did eventually get those things to perform uh, well, but we just spun our tires with the brass prep, it sounds like. I think so. I, I mean, I, I've neck turned quite a bit of stuff in the past, and, and there's no, I've never tested it against itself, so I, I don't know the results. But, yeah, but Miles has, and yeah. the results were uh, less than awe-inspiring, to say yeah, the least. Yeah, and that's not to say that, it, again, that it, if, there may be a like use we've case. Said, yeah, yeah, like we've said before in all of our podcasts, that's what I did. And this, that was the components that I used in six arc. There may be cartridges and chambers that an interference, you know, or interactions between ammo and chamber that could definitely benefit from some or all of that, um, m- much more than what I have seen. But I think, you know, when you get into, th- there's things you can do on the, on the rifle side by picking a chamber and a, a reamer dimensions and, and that we've done a really good job with the SAMI, you know, standard dimensions to make a lot of those picky points a lot less picky. Yeah. And you can set yourself up for success that way. Boom. Heard it here. Well, let's change gears from case prep now to, you mentioned this a couple of time in passing, but let's talk about bullet sorting. That's something that another one I got started on and quit in the middle of the process and was like, this is, yeah, no, not doing this. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So people, they'll sort based OJIVE. Uh, that's probably the most common one, or well, second most common. I'd say most common is probably weight sorting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, just recently we've done quite a bit of testing with the weight sorting thing. Um, I sorted through like 1,200 six millimeter 109 ELDMs uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and then we took, it, it took that many to get a, a large sample of both um, the high and low end of, of what we would get. So I get 30 rounds of each and then we shot them all on radar. Mm. Uh, to look at you know what, drag yeah velocity, velocity velocity and drag were the main things um and the drag is there i mean it it's physics right so yeah. there is that that percentage weight difference but that percentage weight difference is like fractions of one percent like it, it yeah it's not it, it, i forget what it penciled out to but maybe four or five inches at a thousand yards something like that and that's after you isolate out through 1200 bullets sorted out isolate the high and lows so the bulk of everything else falls well within that yeah so, so you're, if you're talking you for know, the f class guy that may have some right there may be some efficacy to that yeah um and then velocity uh on the 30 shot samples of high and low that i think were maybe four tenths apart uh four tenths of a grain apart mm-hmm. uh they were like 0.3 foot per second different um, okay. And uh, we've seen this actually purposefully putting short lead, short and high lead into bullets. Uh, there's kind of a self-correcting thing that happens. Um, you're not at 100% efficiency on the powder burn and it, the burn rate, uh, the, the progressivity of it or whatever, the, like the, the rate at which it burns is a feedback of how much pressure it builds. And it kind of balances the weight out and you can even see this with like pretty extreme examples if you put whatever 35 grains of powder into a cartridge and then you put 140 grain bullet and then you put 135 grain bullet you'll see surprisingly similar muzzle velocities between those extreme spreads of bullet Mm. weight and so yeah those those two that were you know what are four tenths of different they they uh landed like within a foot well within a foot per second of each other on average velocity um, and then the based ogive thing, again, that's something that, that can matter, um, mostly with bullets and chambers that are sensitive to seating depth mm-hmm. of which I think most people are, are, are reading too deep into their small sample testing. Yep. Um, the, the confirmation large, bias yeah, funnel, as you right, call it. Yeah, yeah. The, the large sample testing I've done with seating depth has shown that it can have a small effect like a fine tune. Um, but it, it's not near what people think it is. The, oh, okay. the, the, you know, a, a five thou difference in seating depth is functionally not going to change anything in most situations. All right. Let's, let's get into more on that, that seating depth thing, because years ago now, you know, let's look at post-World War II, right? So you come into the fifties. Now you got the 38 Winchester, you got the 243 Winchester, you got the six millimeter craze, even the 25 millimeter craze going on. And you've got predator hunting like coyotes and colony varmints like prairie dogs uh, being popular in the 50s and the 60s, 70s, present day. Well, in those early years, chamber design isn't what it is today. 
and the ability to make a reamer to a specified dimension in those critical areas in the, you know, forward of the case in that throat area. So it was very, very popular to jam a bullet, you know, you'd see, oh yeah, you got to take these varmint bullets and you got to bury them 5,000 into the lands to get the accuracy out of a, you know, 243 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So is there something to be said about burying a bullet into the rifling? Uh, Certainly I've not experienced, I've not buried anything, but I've come right up to, and in my anecdotal and small sample size testing, there was no benefit coming up to, and then probably was a hindrance uh, being right on the lands. But is there something to be said maybe with looser chambers for, for getting a bullet right up in there? I think so. I think there may be, again, there may be some stuff out there, um, especially older, you know, more dated stuff that you can see a benefit to it. What I will say is if you're going to jam into the lands, you're going to have increased chamber pressure. So for charge weight for charge weight, jammed versus jumping, the jumping one is going to have a lower chamber pressure. Sure. Um, So that's important to keep in mind as you approach that, if you want to test that out for yourself. The other thing I'll say is that you either want to jam or you want to jump. Uh, that area where you go trying to kiss right up to the to the lands, any bit of fouling or anything that builds up or any variation that you have is an on-off switch between that, that little pressure spike you get from having immediate contact or not having it. And so mm. I think what I have seen right at the, at the lands uh, in several different systems with, you know, throughout the years is that you get, yeah, really bad velocity and pressure variation when you, when you try to do that. Okay. So, and generally that relates to, to accuracy as well. Precision yeah. suffers. In those instances where it will probably benefit old school kind of jamming it, is that just getting the bullet started straight in the rifling probably has a looser throat diameter? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's, that's usually where you're going to see that. And then like um, super secant, like to the point of almost looking conical, like that sort of abrupt secant transition may, may benefit from that. That's going to be a totally case by case basis. So I've seen enough with barrels that, like I said, they have attitude and some may like it. Some may really not. Yeah. And it's not. Yeah. Preston, any experience with taking bullets right up there to the rifling? Yeah. Um, w- after you had left tech and gone to the ballistics department, I was all up there by myself. No, I'm just kidding. I had a bunch of good guys with me, but for some reason I had a wild hair and I wanted to do a six dasher just to see what all the craze was about. Right. And at that time, the brass was not readily available. Like it, it was out there, but it wasn't readily available. A lot of people were still fire forming. So I got my hands on some other brass and I fire formed it with a false shoulder as well as uh, jamming. And I did 15 thousands into the lands. And let me tell you, cram, I still got misfires even with a false shoulder. So really? it, it was a, it was a real challenge. I thought I would enjoy that process just because, I'm a, I'm a tinkerer yeah. at heart, but holy cow, when you have a hundred pieces of ammunition that is going to turn into something cool and 25 of them misfire, what a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see any, how was the accuracy during the fire forming it was process? Actually, it was actually really, really good. And that was uh, using our 105 grain Botel hollow point. Yeah. Which is a good which shooting is a bullet. Very forgiving yeah. bullet. It so, is. um, that, that probably had quite a bit to do with it as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mag? recommend it. I I never jammed the wind mag. But, I never had to shoot a 300 wind mag or load for it you, again. So I, one, I got right up close to it. I cut you off there. You were saying we do not recommend jamming bullets. I mean, you're in no man's land. If you're, if you're going to do that, know that you're going to have to reduce that load significantly yeah. and work back. You're, you're on your own and you're essentially, you're, you're wildcatting at that point, even though you might have a Sammy chamber. Like, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. The book data is not. The, never, not the same. never jammed. Yeah. But that wind mag, you did walk those bullets right up close to, uh, didn't jam them, but five, I 10. think I was 15 off on that. Yeah. Um, and that, and that was, was a kind of a non-traditional powder that I had to go to, too, to get that to work. But eventually I did get a good shooting load 15 thou off the lands okay. with a faster burning powder than normal. And that was a standard Sammy twist or a standard Sammy chamber. Yes. Yep. yep. So 10 twist, all the, all the good stuff. 10 twist with a 315 diameter neck uh, or throat rather. Excuse a, lot, me. a lot of area for that bullet to go wonky. Yep. So maybe that would help you. So 
Now, we were talking about the extreme, taking bullets right up to and then jamming them into the rifling. Not many people doing that anymore because it's not functional. You know, I can't go shoot a, a match with that type. Do you remember when we started? There were people that happened There were people regularly. that would time out, look at the RO and say, can I please fire this? You know, that way, if they had to yeah, rack they, it out, you know, the bullet's going to stick yeah, in the rifle. You know the, the bullet's going to stick and you're spilling yeah, powder. Everywhere. So most people not doing that. Right. Let's talk more about seating depth as it relates to what I'm going to call the norm. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousandths off the rifling. Have you done any significant seating depth tests? And if so, what were the results? And as always, the caveat, we're using our OGI profiles, which right. we know are forgiving, and good chambers. Right. Yeah. Sammy Chamber, uh, 6.5 Creedmoor and 6 Arc are the two main ones that I've done. I know uh, Jaden has messed around with some 300 PRC. I have briefly played with it, but nothing serious enough that I want to say anything confidently. Um, but in general anymore, what I do is jump stuff 25 to 35 thousandths or yeah. back to magazine length if that's the, if that's the restriction and I don't worry about it. Yeah. Have you seen in large sample size, a trend of. There was a, yeah. I mean, like I said, there is a performance difference there that is questionable if it's noise or not, but it's there. Okay. And so it may be something, but again, it's like, you're going to dump. 120 rounds into testing to find one that shoots, you know, like marginally a, a, better, a tenth of an inch better at 200 yards or something like that. Okay, so very small results. Result and, and like and not to, not to jump ahead, but I do want to rewind the clocks a little bit. But Miles was once said, and I quote, has once said, and I quote, "I will seat the bullets 50 thousands off the lands and forget that the seating die is adjustable." <laughs> Pick something that works for your magazine, uh, and that's that's. I mean, the main thing. Yeah, jump it thirty-five thou is usually what I aim for, and if that fits in the magazine, then that's what I'm running. Okay. Now, when you said you saw a very potentially, you saw a very marginal change. Mm -hmm. Was that with a five or a ten thou increment or twenty thou increment? Uh, I think I was doing either ten or fifteen thou jumps, um, and then thirty-five rounds at each one, and then I made it back close to a hundred thousandths of an inch. Okay. And that one, that, those tests kind of settled between 20 and 30 thousandths off the lands as being kind of the happy spot. Okay. And um, that was again, marginal. And that's, yeah. And, and again, an the, the difference from the best to the worst was 0.15 inches total group size for a 35 shot group at 200 round or 200 yards. So that's still potentially within the noise of a 35 shot group. Right. Right. Okay. So again, like you mentioned it, I've mentioned it, Preston's already mentioned it. The caveat, we don't know everything. We know what we've tested. We know what you've seen. And there might be some OGI profiles, some chamber designs right. that are more sensitive, but ours, not so much. Yeah. The the combination of stuff that I was testing, and, the, and there may be even some of our stuff that is a little more, you know, susceptible to it. And especially like we talked about the looser, the looser throat geometry where you're going four or five thousandths over bullet diameter or more. Mm-hmm you may you know run into you're more susceptible to running into issues there and especially seeing big swings in performance by by adjusting seating depth there got or it. bigger i would say um but yeah if you've got you know two thousandths over bullet diameter or less uh and then a one and a half degree you yeah. know lead forcing in, cone, yeah, yeah. yeah forcing cone then you're probably not going to see much benefit from playing around with it interesting well that is good to know preston now you're a fan of the magazine holds 2.2, 2, so that's what it is. Right. Or, yeah. 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 And then we'll get to, to our setups this year, but that's not what I'm doing this year, but I am just a blank number off of the rifling, and that's where it's going to live for thousands of rounds. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's uh, transition now, before we talk about your load development methods, briefly, let's hit on the common load development methods, the most common one that I used to do. Preston, I believe you as well. That's just a simple ladder test. Just the ladder test. That always worked. Let's talk about OCW, ladder test, and then the Satterley method as well. I think those three gather almost everybody in yeah. the reloading and some community. Form, and people make variations on these, sure. but it's all more yeah. or less the same. So walk us through a quick ladder test. So you you pick, uh, I don't know, let's say your max charge is 44 grains. Uh, of powder, then I'm going to load in 0.3 or 0.5 grain increments from 41 up to 43. 
And then I'm going to shoot all of them at some distance away, 400, 600, 1,000 yards. And I'm looking for groups within, you know, the areas within that powder charge ladder that all of the vertical comes to a, a, flat, a, spot. Simil a flat spot, a similar point. Look at this. A hundred free bullets when I buy these select Hornady reloading tools. Wow, 500 free bullets with certain Hornady reloading presses and kits. Well, what do they have? Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading bench. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, I'm buying. Okay. So, and you can, I, I always did that at one and 200 yards because that was what was convenient. Right. Um, but that o seems... OCW is more or less the same thing. You're just looking at point of impact and how the groups are at a shorter distance, typically okay. 100, 200 yards. And you're, you're going through yeah. still a, we, a, we would call it a powder ladder. Yeah. You're still, and then you're just looking for group size, uh, velocity spreads, and then where actually where the point of aim, point of impact correlation is as you go through. But almost all of this is three shot or five shot groups. Yep. You're well, some ladders are done with one. Right. And yeah. And then the Satterley test takes that to the extreme. It is one shot, and then you just jump up in powder increments, powder charge increments, and you're looking just at the velocity data because what you'll see with single shots at growing powder charges. Is as you increase powder charge, your velocity goes up, flat, up, maybe dips down, up, and does a little roller coaster. Um, yeah, as you go up. And, and, then, and then what you would be looking for, your node, your velocity node, is the area where it dips low. And yeah. so then you have multiple powder charges that are producing more or less the same velocity uh, on a single round. Mm -hmm. So again, small sample size, going to bite you there. Right. Yeah, it and hurts so, my chest just hearing one single round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so what happens when you repeat the Satterley test or a ladder test or an OCW test 30 times or 50 times or 100 times? Or like, twice. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. Like, because I, I know Jeff Seward's website has a 100 shot repetition of the Satterley test. I did a 35 shot repetition of the, or 35 repeat uh, yeah. Satterley test and then, you know, poked back and forth on ladder tests and OCW tests. When you push each variable change, so powder charge or seating depth, when you push that to 20, 30, 50 rounds per change of the variable, all of that bouncy sinusoidal little humps in the graph, yeah. they all go away. It straight becomes line. just a straight line. Yeah. So what you're, what you're seeing with those small sample tests is if you could draw out the average muzzle velocity versus powder charge increase, you'd have more or less a straight line. And then you have the extreme spread, plus or minus, from that. So you could have your main line, your error brackets, and your Saturday test is just bouncing around inside that error bracket. That's all you're That's doing. All, so all wow. that zigzag stuff, flat spots, nodes, velocity nodes, it's, it doesn't exist. Wow. Could and, be useful, though, if you have a target velocity that you want to hit though. Yes. Yeah. So, so certainly. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can see things like average velocity in about 10 rounds. So if you, you know, like that's pretty accurate within five, 10 foot per second, you're going to see that if you shoot at 10 shots. Straight. Okay. So with those in mind, that kind of traditional ways, and we've been talking about sample sizes. Oh, yeah. Before we go on, yeah. same thing with, with group size. So group sizes, I think we've covered this in several different podcasts now, but group size is extremely variable. Group size is a is such a variable metric until you get literally 20 or 30 or 50 shots into the group that it's almost it's almost entirely useless below I would say 20 shots as as a predictor of of like okay I shoot 5 of of 40.4 grains and I shoot 5 of 41 grains and this one's you know 0.3 and this one's 0.6 you could repeat that flip flop the same. You they're fifty percent bigger or smaller. However, one hundred percent bigger, fifty percent smaller. Right? Those two groups are, but literally, you, ha you statistically, you just cannot have confidence in them. If you repeat that, repeat that, repeat that, repeat that, you'll find that those two things. It may be completely opposite when you get down to the brass tacks of it. This one may slightly outperform the one that shot smaller on the first five shot group. You're you're at total at the whim of total random odds. 
That's interesting. And again, we have talked about that in many, many podcasts. So yeah. uh, if, this, if you're listening to this podcast and this is new information to you, we right. definitely got some homework for you. <laughs> uh, but let, all right, let's move on now to what you do. So we've gotten, like I mentioned at the beginning, we've just get this question all the time, even though you've answered it explicitly answered this direct question several times on this podcast before. Now this is a dedicated podcast to it. We went through some of the traditional methods of advanced reloading and load development, but now, all right, Miles Neville, six arc, it's PRS season, your open division again, top 10 finish, by the way, in the first match of the year. Great job. Thank you. Good work. Uh, uh, how do you do the load development for you? What do, what do you do? Where do you start? What prep and walk us through that load development? The, the, big, the big thing that I do right off the bat is same lot and manufacture brass, same lot and manufacture bullet, and as much of the same lot powder as I can get. Okay. That's a good place to start. Like if you can get a barrel's worth of components, all the same lot from the get go, that's, that's bar none the way to go. Okay. You'll, you'll cut out a lot of variation because you'll see lot to lot bullets, there's manufacturing tolerance. And then we have windows. This is everybody's bullets. We weren't, you know, we're not alone here, but there is subtle things that can change that can either, you know, move point of impact or the dispersion level or whatever. There, there are things that you can massage out otherwise. But if you just jump from one lot to the next, you can run into safety issues and accuracy issues and velocity issues, all sorts of things. Same thing goes for powder. Powder is big. Like people, I think, underestimate the variation that you see lot to lot, even from canister grade commercial powder that you get really? at the gun store. Um, so as much of that as you can do all one lot for this barrel, the better off you're going to, the okay. less headache you're going to have. So start off consistent. Yep. Um, but what I will do is take, say, I, I usually have a bullet in mind. So six millimeter, it's going to be a 110A tip or I'm, this year I start out with 109 ELDMs. Um, I've got my bullet selected. I set up my die. So I'm jumping 35 thousandths. I forget that it's adjustable. And then I will take two or three applicable powders or maybe more if there are popular powders. And I look for, you know, you can look online. I don't recommend reading online load data and taking it as like safe load data because most right. people are out of their minds but um, yeah, we could mention that there is <laughs> literally load data given on some of the forums that you've gone and tested i've got as high as eighty four thousand yeah. psi yeah so don't check the actual yeah, yeah. charge weight but it is worthwhile Use, to see see what powders are working for people yeah what's because winning if it yeah exactly if 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 varget is working for everybody that shoots a dasher Maybe there's a good, maybe there's a happy spot there, right? So that's a good place to look. So I'll look for those. So like try Varga 8208 XBR. This is for my arc, right? So I'll try that H4895, maybe, maybe Reloader 15 and a half, right? And I'll load up 10 rounds of each of those powders, about a grain off of book max. Okay. So I'm just bumping down off of book max uh, and maybe more if it's a Magnum, I'll, you know, maybe a couple grains, but that's just to get me in a happy spot. I know that I, I should be safe there shouldn't have any wonky issues because um, sometimes like erratic stuff gets worse the more you stand on pressure. Sure. So I try to avoid that if I can. And then I'll shoot those, a 10 shot group of each of those. And that's a, I call it a feeler because that's going to tell me if something's shooting a minute and a half on a 10 shot, I don't, I don't want it. You don't need to pursue that. Yeah. We can, we can cull those. So any of those that are bad, okay, I don't want those. Yeah, if we know they, they'll never they, get better. Right. If the extreme spread on a 10 shot is 140 foot per second, I'm done with it. Like, I can't have that. So weed out the ones then that don't work, the ones that are left over, I'll go back and I'll load up 20 of each and I'll shoot those. I'll get velocity and group data off of all that. Um, we're lucky we have that, the tunnel with the acoustic mic system, but if you don't have that, you can also use like the group analysis tool on the Hornady Fordoff app. Right. And you can do four or five shot groups. But the important thing is to correlate your point of aim with all your point of impacts. So that when you combine all four of those together, it's all to a common reference aiming point. And then your composite group, then you can pull data off of that for mean radius or, or however you want to look at it, group size. Yeah, which we, you primarily looking at mean radius. Mean radius. Mean radius levels out sooner and is less noisy sooner than group size. Group size stays pretty noisy all the way up until you get like an unreasonable amount of rounds into a group, something that I would never expect anybody to do 50, a hundred rounds. I mean, I would say group shape 
figures into that a little bit, you yeah, know, whether if, you're looking at one or the other. Yeah. If, uh, but that's after my 20 shotters, 10 shotters. I don't really put a lot of like, you've got it. You're like, Oh, you need to bed that rifle. It's string and horizontal. And then I go back and I shoot a 20 shot group and it, it's a round group. That's just, I happen to get a string of horizontal shots on that five or 10 shot, you know, okay. feeler that I was doing. Well, I'd, I'm not saying you need to do it because of the group. I just wanted you to bet it because it makes me feel warm and yeah, fuzzy. Well, if, it if just you looks better. If you don't need it, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you had a rear pillar in that either. Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, one, you didn't. Uh, plus, I was believing in it. Okay. Yeah, that's you all you got to believe in yourself. That's what you do. You got to believe in yourself. <laughs> um, Shout out to Josh. Yeah. Josh Clough's a wonderful human being. Well, he believes in us too. Yeah. I right. believe in him. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's it. And I, so I'll, I'll take, you know, from that 20 shot string sample set, whatever of each of those powders that I've got, I'll pick the best performing one. And it may come into one has better velocity spreads, but worse group and, you know, vice versa. Uh, or maybe you get lucky and it's the best group and the best velocity. But then, you, you know, in that you have to weigh out, okay, what's that velocity worth downrange for elevation spread? What percentage of my targets am I engaging that far away? You know, like, you yeah, gotta, you gotta yeah, make it make sense. Weigh it out, weigh it out, make it make sense for what you're doing. Um, and then I pick that. And from that point, I may try to push up or down powder charge to hit a velocity window, maybe. Uh, if I care, most of the time, I'm plum happy with being at a pretty modest charge weight because I found when you get dirt, when you get water, when you get mud involved. Uh, running right at the ragged edge it's usually causes more problems than the 50 foot per second or 100 foot per second benefit you get out of the trajectory. Okay. And so, yeah, from that point on, that's the load. I load up as much as I got brass for and uh, it. keep loading that. Yeah. Until the barrel burned out. So w- far as brass or I see, goes. I mean, other issues. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll trim them once, usually after the first firing and then inside, outside, um, Deeper, chamfer deburr. Chamfer deburr. Because yep. Yep, it's on the trimmer I'm using that it's built in. So. Yeah. Well, and Jeff Seward, you mentioned him earlier. We had him on the podcast talking, talking about cartridge cases and he did some huge sample size testing uh, for the military. He did some large sample size testing on a precision rifle system. And one of the correlations they found was inside chamfering had a direct correlation to dispersion. If you didn't do that, it right. increased dispersion. So Always, you know, inside neck chamfer oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, you can't do any good by shaving copper off the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't be, that can't be right. <laughs> so it, it, to scale this back now and kind of summarize that, basically, okay, I know I'm shooting this cartridge. Here's some powders from a burn rate standpoint that work. And you're heavily connected, so you kind of know. But for somebody else, they right. go, okay, here's the powders that work. I'm going to look at some reloading manuals. I want to find out what people are using in this burn rate speed that are winning. Right. Is it Vitivorian 140? Is it Varget? Is it, you know, fill in the blank? Right. And if I can't get that, is there an alternative? What do the alternatives look like? So mm-hmm. you isolate a high-performance propellant, you isolate the high-performance bullet, and you shoot 10, scrape the, the stuff off the top that, that you don't want, Yep. and then you shoot 20 or 30 shot samples of what's left, winner takes all. Right. And if, and if anywhere in there I don't get anything that I like, uh, I'll try a different bullet. Yeah. Um, that component swapping, so swapping a new type of powder, swapping a new bullet in, those are big rough knob changes. Yes, like Preston so, said, the Pareto and principle. I, I don't know how many people I've watched take a combination of a bullet and a powder and run it six ways to Sunday for 400 rounds and then you know never find anything that consistently performs for them because it's it's not, it's not gonna, right? Like, <laughs> yep. it's just not gonna, you can play with seating depth all you want. You can play with powder all you want. You're, you're going to burn up so many components trying to force that to work when at the beginning, had you just said, oh, that didn't work very well. Let me try this powder instead, or let me try this bullet instead. You, you got a much better chance of like whoosh, sucking that up. You may find one that's performs even worse, right? You, but you, you may, <laughs> You know what I mean? But you're going to make big changes in performance just by that component swapping. So that's yep. the 80, 20, like get, do the easy changes to get the bulk of the work done for you. Because then once you got something that already performs within your expectations, with, within what you want it to do, then you can play around a little bit if you want to mess w- with seating depth. Yeah, or I would something. say if you're almost there, you almost have you, what you need for your expectations. As a r- general rule, not always the case. If you back off on powder charge, dispersion goes down. So yeah. if you have velocity to give up, 
but dispersion to gain, yeah, that is one thing you charge. can do. And yeah, but you have to be almost there. It can't be like shooting horrible and you expect it to fix all everything. Of a sudden be yeah. The the so one. Do you guys drop significantly, or are you oh, yeah. doing like grain, three at least tenths? a grain? If you're not changing at least seven tenths to a grain when you do do changes, if you're looking for a performance shift, yeah, uh, you're wasting your time. Wow. All right. So, Miles, thanks for walking us through your load development process. Preston, I know yours is very similar. What's load development look like for Preston? And I will say, M- Miles's method is the single man's method. Mine's the married with kids guy method. Okay. We'll, just, we'll just put it that way. You're probably in the same boat. Yeah. Um, I will pick the powder that I want to use. Like I, I already, I already know it right off the off the bat. If you don't know it, obviously you got to do a little bit of research and see what people are using and having the most success with, and and what, what are you more have. people using. What's than available others. too? Yeah. Right. When I was doing that that Dasher stuff, I couldn't get the powder that I wanted, so I had to use an alternate. But um, so I will load up twenty rounds because that's what the acoustic system downstairs will store, and I will seat them fifty thousands, thirty five thousands, whatever it is, off of the lands. Still fitting in the mag. Still fit in the mag. And I will go shoot them at a, I, I would say, because the data that we're able to shoot is using our own components, and obviously I'm using our own components, I go a little bit closer to max than you do, typically, um, especially in the arc, because I do want a little bit little bit more velocity. It's, it's a smaller case, but um, yeah, I, I will literally go down to the lab, shoot 20 rounds, and if it's good, we're, we're done. That's it. <laughs> That's it. You know, you got a high performance propellant. You got a match bullet, match barrel. All right, we know this is this is either going to work or it ain't. In the in the history of our since we've been talking about um, you know large sample sizes, I've had two barrels that didn't agree with anything, and and I did you know switch components. I switched powder. I switched bullets, and those barrels just went away, and I got new ones, and life was good again. Utilize your space your way with the modular Hornady Security Square Lock Organizing System. Mount the Square Lock panels anywhere in your home or shop, then attach the wide assortment of Square Lock accessories to securely store firearms, tools, gear, or any other valuables in any possible configuration. Keep your reloading bench or gun room organized with the Square Lock Modular Organizing System from Hornady Security. Yeah. Yep. Keeping it simple. Focus on the 20% of items that give you 80% of the performance. Yep. Bullets, benefit. barrels, powder. Yep. Swap those around if you can. And in a quality barrel, there's something to be said there. Like, you, yeah. I, you know, there's, you can ring more performance out of a factory rifle hand loading than you often can with available factory ammunition. Right? That's a thing that you got more you got more options to play with. You don't know what powder is in the factory ammo for the most part, right? It, it's the seating depth is fixed. Like that's a that's a it is what it is. You can't change it with mm-hmm. with hand loading. You can change it. You can make it better. But if you're going for the ultimate in precision, I think you're doing yourself a disservice to start with a budget factory barrel. Uh, yeah. If you want the easy button to tight groups. Just go ahead and get yourself a quality match barrel. Doesn't matter. Benchmark makes good button barrels. There's several others, you know, Schillen. Yeah. There, yeah. There's there's good button and cut rifle barrels out there, but jumping that step from factory, semi factory, quasi factory, whatever, to that purpose built yeah. match barrel. This is a custom barrel. Yeah. That is that takes away a lot of the weird stuff. I that, would agree. You get I mean, you want to give yourself an accuracy guarantee. Not a real guarantee, of course, but you want to just like, oh, I know it's going to perform. Uh, for me, and I think for a lot of us, well, then you go get a high quality cut rifle steel barrel. You get a a Bart line, a proof, you know, something. Yeah, HS Rock Creek. Yeah, uh, and then on the button yeah. side, I mean, a lot of us like to go carbon, so you have proof research. Obviously, you got carbon six out there. Uh, the preferred barrels. I've had some really good experience yeah. with those. Yeah. So there's between buttons and cut rifling now. There's a bunch of high quality barrels yeah. out there they're more more than i i yeah i forget them every time i try to name them all off there's tens tens of very good quality barrel makers out there yeah. that are making stuff that you can achieve that last little bit you mm-hmm, know yeah. of, of precision with and not to go too far off subject again but miles mentioned get as much 
brass bullets powder as you can of the same lot for that barrel um the match ammunition that i will use in my six arc i can't tell you how many lots of brass are in it and i know for a fact that there's two lots of 110a tips uh they all measured and weighed the same so i'm not too worried about it but we, we know that some things are hard to find right now so don't limit yourself if i mean if, if all you can get is what you can get go do it you know it's an expensive yeah. sport yeah. get what Spend you can the time behind the gun but the match ammunition that i'm using is from in, in all regards <laughs> it shouldn't be as good as it is but i'm also shooting it through a high quality barrel yeah and i feel like that's one of the things that a lot of the f class guys and bench rest guys that oh they're tuning their load and and you know they get really into tuning things and and they oh yep this load shoots really great reality is they probably all shot really great because yeah. you have 50 pound guns 60 pound you know bench rest guns or these right. really elaborate you know looks like skis that my kids could ski down a mountain <laughs> on bipods on these f class guns and the most expensive barrels and the quality gunsmiths quality tooling everything's perfect yeah you you'd be really hard pressed to make something shoot poorly yep. out of that yeah out of I that agree. system so um i would the only thing i'm going to add before we close this thing out in the regard to uh load development is the hunting rifle we spent most of this talking about precision rifles well for me my hunting rifles are precision rifles as well the only difference i because i i do it basically like Preston does. However, in a hunting rifle, I got to do it segmented because sure. I can't just go pound twenty shots on a on a yeah. on a barrel. So a carbon fiber barrel, <laughs> a carbon fiber barrel, or a smaller contour, sure. you know, maybe fluted barrel that ends at seven seventy five or eight hundred. Oh, yeah. Just can't do that. Or Probably less. don't want to do it on a no contour barrel with that much powder. Oh, yeah, you know? and a lot of the Magnum hunting cartridges too. Uh, seven PRC, three hundred PRC. Uh, I'm if doing. I, if I'm shooting ten, like I'm feeling bad about it. <laughs> yeah. So. I like to do like a five, three shot group method, or, you know, if you wanted to go further, right. obviously you could do up to, you know, do a 21 shot group and then make a composite out of it. And the hard part for me, for all of us, I think for the listener is follow these, you know, what I'm going to call advanced reloading techniques and load development process. You do have to make an alignment change when you're doing this process with your hunting rifle, because there is a difference. I can... I've done Preston's method exactly. Oh, got my match gun put together. I want to shoot Varget with 110A tips at this length that fits in my mags. We'll go see what it shoots. Oh, shot 1.4 inches at 200 yards with a 0.38 mean radius. We're done. Completely done. You can't do that same thing with a hunting rifle. One, just with the speed. You have to do it disjointed and then make a, a composite group. But two, you're very, very unlikely to get 7 PRC, 300 PRC, any of the, you know, the Magnums, Win Mags or Rim Mags in a hunting rifle platform that you can shoot and have it perform like that match gun. Right. You're talking about a six arc and a 20 pound match gun or and heavier. then, or, or heavier, and then a eight to 10 pound hunting rifle with a 300 PRC. Yeah. You, One is more shootable than the other. Right. The impulse is dramatically more. The, you know, the mass of the rifle is dramatically less. So then you as the shooter, your fundamentals, your application, you're, you're actually executing the fundamentals has to be perfect, perfect to achieve the same dispersion between those two platforms. Yep. So that's been uh, not a necessarily a tough pill to swallow, but it's just like, wow, yeah, I'll, I'll lay down and shoot a five shot group right. with the seven PRC I have built that just. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a single hole, holy cow. Uh, and then you make a 25 or, or 21 shot composite and it's like, okay, not every five shot group's a single hole and it's not shooting, you know, 0.3 mean radius. I mean, it's, it's real close. I think my 7 PRC is like a 0.41 mean radius at 200. Yeah. Uh, so it's very much a precision instrument, but it does take some realignment in that world. Yeah, and yeah. I think going from what we used to do to what we do now, you, you have to adjust your expectations. Mm -hmm. I mean... There's been times when I've shot a five shot group with the old match gun and said, we're done here. And then you go ahead and shoot a 20 shot group with that same gun or the next gun or the next barrel, whatever have you. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is horrible. And then you go talk to Miles and he's like, oh yeah, yeah I guess you're done here. I'm like, okay, I need to adjust my expectations mm -hmm. because it's not yeah, quarter MOA well, anymore. And it, it does hurt a little bit, but 
you got to think of big picture. It does you the service. It, you are better because of it. If you truly know the dispersion in the cone of fire of your rifle system, yep. you're at a better right. point to, okay, do I need to make a correction on this next shot? Or is it possible I missed simply because of my cone of fire? And if you think that your rifle is throwing darts, shooting laser beams into single holes and the bullet goes where your crosshairs point every single time you pull the trigger, you might be making corrections when you don't need to make a correction at all. And that can be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, I don't, the way I relate it to is, uh, imagine the flattest, nicest road. I think I've said this on the podcast before too. Imagine the flattest, nicest road you've ever driven on the newest highway that just, you know, glass driving across it. It's glass. I think a lot of people, um, pull out their, their, uh, magnifying glass and then go looking at the little rocks in the asphalt and say, Oh, look at all these little bumps. Look at all that. Mm-hmm. So this is incredibly rough. And it's at, in reality, zoom out, you're, you're <laughs> driving a car on the road and it's the nicest road you've ever been on. Yep. Um, so take that for what it's worth. But yeah, there's for PRS. If I have a rifle ammo combo that's shooting 20 shots at three quarter minute, I'm yeah. running with it. Yeah. I mean, you'll go finish in the top 10. <laughs> that's, a, that's what I'm shooting. You know, um, believing that my rifle is going to shoot 0.1s, 0.2s, 0.3s all day long. Well, if I just shot a bunch of five shot groups, it would probably make a lot of those, but then occasionally it's going to throw the extreme end of that. It's going to throw a three quarter minute group. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. And then and where's I, your head at? Yeah, exactly. So then you're like, what did I do wrong there? What happened? Something was off there. Well, it's like, no, that's just part of it. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, realigning, Realigning your your point of view to reality is, I think, important both for the the precision shooter and for especially for the hunter because yeah, you, you get to actually putting rubber to the road and saying, oh yeah, th- well I just shot twenty shots and it was minute and a half. Maybe I shouldn't be shooting twelve hundred yards yeah. at big game animals. Right. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more, guys. Well, I appreciate you kind of walking us through one miles all the large sample size testing that you've done in a testing environment and two preston sharing your large sample stuff that you've done anecdotally and walking us through you know what was the precision reloading tactics of of yesteryear and and honestly not that long ago yesterday and still and then walking us through using the kind of the pareto principle what really works what it takes to really get some big changes and dial things in quickly and and uh, our listeners, there you go. This was uh, from the horse's mouth, Miles' own low development process. Guys, anything else? <laughs> Everybody's been asked for it. What are you running for? I mean, there's gear nerds out there. What are you running this year for your PRS? Yeah, well, let's, let's walk through the setup real uh, quick. American Rifle Company Nucleus 2.0 action. Uh, got I'm that a eight. gear nerd too, by the way. It's, that yeah. wasn't derogatory. And Miles <laughs> thinks this is the best action ever made. Uh, or, or right up there. I think for what you can get, yeah, it's a it's a close tie between a few of them. The the big horns are nice. Um, impacts, I think between impacts and nucleus, man, I have a hard time. Well, I mean, now is for the great, PRS. This is for the PRS yeah. game. Well, right? I just mean in, in general. In general, between there's so many customs actions out there now that are amazing. It's a between, it's a it's a point of like cool guy points and what yeah, you think is cool. Stiller they're, American they're all, Rifle Company, yeah. Zermat impact i mean the list goes on and on yeah okay it's, so. a, it's a point totally a point of personal preference at that level yeah. it's it, what features you like and what make yeah. you feel good about yourself nucleus 2.0 yep um trigger tech special at about a pound and a half is that pound right? and a half, pound we, and a half. We, we measured it yeah uh, american rifle company xylo chassis uh and then that hs precision 28 inch uh six arc barrel yeah buddy what are you running for mags with the six arc uh the mdt MDT has those BR yep. arc mags. Yep, and they work great. What, what do you got for glass on top? Uh, Night Force Attacker F1, 4 to 20. That's a, that's a slick setup, man. That's an and interesting choice. Big old muzzle brake on that sucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Running uh, 30 cal. Um, Area 419, oh. Hellfire Match. Yep. Which is a good point, now that you mention it. Um, that is another final tune that you can play with. Uh, Soul device. When you get, get all your load development done to the best of what you, you get, uh, if you're still curious, you know, maybe I could improve that a little bit. I'd like that to be a little better. You can swap muzzle devices and mm-hmm. you might be surprised. Got a, you got a good chance of seeing distinct dispersion profiles tied to muzzle devices. The gas gun from last year was much more sensitive to it. Ah, um, as it was most yeah, everything. Right. But, uh, and so the bolt gun, it's not a huge change, but you can definitely tell 
different muzzle devices, suppressors, different brakes. Um, yeah, so the one I'm running is the one that shot the best. I dig it. Preston, you're a gear guy. We're gear guys. Most of the folks listening are. What's your setup look like this year? Um, American Rifle Company Coup de Gras. The Coupe de Gras, Jay. Attached to it is a Bartland 28-inch, uh, their competition contour, 6-millimeter arc. Mm. Uh, it's sitting in a Foundation Genesis 2, I believe. It's for sure a Foundation. Yeah. Uh, the model, I think, is a Gen 2 or a Genesis 2. Um, Hawkins bottom metal, MDT, 12-round BR mags. Um, Hawkins one piece mount and a vortex gen three razor with an ace break out front on that one. Ace break. Look at you. Awesome. Well, uh, fine setups. Yeah. And it's certainly the nut behind the bolt. That's going to win the it, match. It, because I was going to say that because this particular, uh, gun shoots 1.1 inches with like a 0.28 mean radius at 200 the, yards. Probably the best shooting rifle I've ever seen next to one of his, but I don't know what your shoots, but. He could take mine and beat the crap out of me with it. <laughs> yeah. That's generally how it works. Yeah. You can't, you can, you can reload yourself with like all these techniques and, and the gear. You can reload yourself into losing, but at, after a certain level, you can't reload or brass prep or tune your way to win. It's the nut behind the bolt. Yep. Same thing with the gear. You can gear your way to the bottom of the pack, but after a certain level, you're not gearing your way to the top. Yep. Do you know what your shoots offhand? Uh, I think the last time I shot it in the tunnel, it was like inch 350 or so. And uh, mean radius, yeah, 0. 0.3, low 0. 0.3, somewhere in there. Mm. And he'd still, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> close, but yeah. He that's, could beat that's you really with good. the M1 Grand. Uh, I <laughs> I'm think, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. The, uh, the best stuff I've ever done, uh, and I guess another side note, I know, since we're on rambling on side notes here, but the alternative method uh, that no, I, I've done one time and will never do again but you can do is the method of exhaustion and that's 20 rounds of every variable change that you want to go through. So that's a powder ladder. That's different powders. That's different seating depths, different bullets, 20 rounds each and just bank on shooting six, 800 rounds. You shot literally over 600 rounds to do this. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you will find the best combination. Um, you could probably get 95% of the way there in less than 200 rounds for sure. But uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely an option. And I guess to relay, why would somebody do that? The whole point of the low development thing, I think, is to quantify and qualify different combinations of loads to see which is the best performing one. Um, and to reiterate, those small sample tests that have historically been traditionally used don't give you a statistical confidence in the result that you're getting, because when you repeat them and repeat them and repeat them, they're variable. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point that we push 20, 20. If we look at statistical analysis in general, 20 is like below what most people would want to do from like a statistician would say 20. Nah, yeah, that's pretty noisy data. They want 30, 50. That's kind of the floor. They'd really like hundreds or thousands of data points. Yeah. So, um, obviously that's not realistic for. Yeah. Cause your, your barrel's done. Yeah. Your barrel. Yeah. yeah. Um, but just bear that in mind that, yeah, if the whole point is for you to quantify and qualify these loads against each other, then you should at least have some repeatability in the test and some confidence in the performance that you measure. Yep. And that's, that's kind of the whole point. So you, for you as a, a practical reloader, right. 20 is your basement. Yeah. 20 you, is the floor. Uh, 20 it, gives you the warm and fuzzy. If you really want to double check, you'll do a 30 or a right, 50. Right. Go read yep. a statistics book and it'll make sense. And if you needed to, you could probably look at mean radius at 10 and that would make you, that would, that's a lot better than group size at 10. Sure. A lot better. Yeah. Mean radius, unfortunately, again, there's no, I've tried every way you can to cheat, can't the, cheat the numbers. It. Mean radius kind of falls in around 18 to 20 shots and below that group size, mean radius, flip a coin. They're both very variable mm -hmm. within, within the practical use application of like a PRS shooter or F-class or bench rest or a precision hunter, something like that. You can still get enough variation there that, unfortunately, yeah. It's sad. It's sad to learn all that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it yeah. makes me feel warm and fuzzy because at least it's accounting for all the shots. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's liberating. Awesome, guys. Well, I appreciate you going through all this. For the listener out there, definitely check out, you know, episodes 50 and 52 about your groups are too small. Check out the episode on Mean Radius. Uh, we put out a bunch of this information for you. And uh, guys, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. You bet. Yeah, we should have called this picking a load, not load development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone out there, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. You asked, we listened. Here's how 
those of us here in the precision rifle world at Hornady do load development. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.